It's November, 1944. An all-African American tank battalion known as the Black Panthers advances through World War II battlegrounds near the French town of Weblin. Suddenly, enemy fire heats up around them. The battalion is forced to stop. Standing right in front of them, blocking the road, is a large tree filled with anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. All it would take is one false move, and they could all die instantly. The leader of the battalion, Staff Sergeant Reuben Rivers, jumps out of the lead tank. The radio goes wild, with everyone urging him to stay in. What is he doing? Sergeant Rivers grabs a heavy steel cable, places it over his shoulder, and rushes to the booby-trapped tree. Rifle shots get closer to him as he wraps the cable around the tree. A rifle shot hits some steel inches away from Rivers. Sure, he's scared, but he knows this is the only way to clear the path for the tanks. The cable is in place, and Sergeant Rivers rushes back, yelling to the battalion. The lead tank uses all of its might to pull at the tree. And as the tree is dragged by the tank, the mines are ignited in front of them, but far enough away so there's no danger. Smoke quickly fills the air around the tanks. They pause, wait to see if anything else will blow up. And when it doesn't, the advance continues. His men are amazed. They've just witnessed the actions of a true hero. But Sergeant Rivers doesn't have time to bask in the glory. As the commander, he has one job. Keep the battalion moving. And he follows one simple rule. A stalled tank is a dead tank. In 1997, Staff Sergeant Reuben Rivers was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his valor in November 1944. The clearing of the landmines was just one of many times he risked his life to save his fellow soldiers. He even ignored his own fatal wounds to advance the tanks further and to help the Americans rid the country of the Nazis. His story is so incredible that one could even describe him as a real-life superhero. So it's only natural that River's story is now the subject of a comic book, released this March by AUSA's publishing team. Medal of Honor Reuben Rivers tells the hero's tale from his upbringing to his exploits in the field, bringing it all to life with art and words. Those words are written by comic book writer Chuck Dixon. And in today's episode, our hosts sit down with him to discuss the project, talk about the military-themed comics he's written in his career, and learn how paying taxes can lead to artistic inspiration. I'm Carrie Varu Heikis, and this is Army Matters. Welcome back to Army Matters. I am your co host, and I got a good friend with me today. Hey, good friend. So, what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about something fun. Actually, we're going to talk about comic books. Nice. I love comic books. Did you read comics growing up? I did. How about you? No, I never really did. I don't know if it's because we didn't have money to buy them. I, there was only like one little store in town that actually sold them. Yeah. And they didn't sell many. You're I remember right. that. It was like a little corner store. That corner store? Yeah. You know, small town. Right. Did your mom send you to the corner store to go get some butter? Did they call you Danny or Daniel? Uh, it depends. My brothers call me Danny. Okay. My mother, if she was upset with me, would call me Daniel. Daniel. And then I had a childhood nickname that my mom and dad called me. What, what was your nickname? I'm afraid to say. Go ahead. We want to know. It was Booper. Booker? Booper. Boop. Boop. Booper. What's Boop. Bo- what does that mean? Booper. I don't know. I guess when I was a baby, I used to go boop, 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 boop. Okay. Uh, booper, I guess. Booper. I That's so special. Thanks That's for crazy. sharing that. I know. Yeah, that's cool. So, did you know Yeah, that AUSA has their own comic series? Yes. I did know before I came to work at AUSA. That's right. And I bet many of our listeners do not know that, though. We have one of the nation's leading comic writers who helps us create our Medal of Honor series. That's right. 
a new comic about Staff Sergeant Ruben Rivers is being released this month. And he's here to talk about that as well. Now, I'm told this gentleman has written more comic book series than any other American in history. Really? Period. Chuck Dixon, welcome to Army Matters. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. So you got time to talk to us. Uh, shouldn't you be like drawing somewhere? Well, I'm a writer, actually. You write? Yeah. I tell the artists what to do. Oh, you, that's, that's even better. <laughs> that's, that's like me telling Dan what to do every day. There you go. Yes, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about your family experience. As I mentioned in the opening, you talked about military-related comics that you've done, and obviously you help AUSA produce the Medal of Honor series. What's your connection to the military, Joe? Well, I never served, but, you know, I'm a boomer. So uh, all of our dads were in, in service in World War II. And uh, in my neighborhood, we had a lot of guys uh, who were combat vets. And my own dad was a, a bombardier on B-17s with the, with the 8th Air Force over Europe. And um, they'd have a few beers on the front stoop and start telling war stories. <laughs> yeah. And I'd always be there listening. It was better than TV. And uh, that created a curiosity in me. So whenever I meet any vet, uh, even recently back from Afghanistan or wherever, I've always got questions. Uh, and I've always been curious. And I've always Chuck, wanted to hear their story. Chuck, my grandfather was a bombardier. Wow. On a B-17, probably at the same time as your father was. As a matter of fact, and I know you, were, you are from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Yes. They were from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, not too oh, far okay. away. Yeah. yeah, so they may have they may have met each other. <laughs> Some, well, well, my my dad mm -hmm. was a was a high school not even a high school dropout. He dropped out of school at thirteen during the depression, mm -hmm. but he was a mechanical genius, and he wanted to uh, distinguish service cross for wow. suggesting mechanical improvements to the Norden bomb site. Oh my goodness, gracious. which they made and made it more accurate. So talent runs deep in the family, and you, you're going to hear that. Our listeners are going to figure that out today. <laughs> now, back to your father, though, before we move on. He had a friend that your father always talked about. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, my dad would always talk about his friend and, and, and the horrible things that had happened to his friend mm -hmm. over Europe uh, with flack and the horrible things his friend had seen. After my father died, we found out there was no friend. Those were his experiences. Those were things he saw. I guess it was a sense of humility. He didn't want to like, I'm a big hero or brag or anything like that. But yeah. you know, he shared his experiences through this imaginary friend that served with them. Yeah, that's an incredible perspective. Yeah. So let's talk about your literary work and how that came about in your life. You know, you've done incredible amount of writing um, all across the field too, not just comics, I assume. Right. Where did this all start, Joe? Where, where did that passion come from? I was hospitalized a lot as a kid, uh, and everybody would bring me comic books, and I just became immersed in them. They became a second language to me. I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading comics. I mean, even before I could read, I was reading comics. I never wanted to do anything else. I was exposed to that. I just fell in love with the comic book medium. So from those days, um, who was your favorite comic book hero? Uh, probably earliest one was Batman and then, uh, th then Spider-Man came along and, uh, became my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still have some of those comics today? A few, not yeah. all of them. Not a few. <laughs> They're worth a lot of money. <laughs> yes. worth a lot of money, some of them. <laughs> yes. So Chuck, one of the first comics that you, you wrote when you started this industry was a series called The Nam for Marvel Comics. Can you tell us your experience in writing that? The NAM was created by uh, Doug Murray, who was a Vietnam vet. And after a while, they decided to change writers, and they asked me to write it. I was like, I, I was, I'm not a Vietnam vet. I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't feel right doing it. And so my editor said, well, talk to Larry Hama, who is famous as the creator of so many G.I. Joe characters. And he was an editor at Marvel at the time, and he was a Vietnam combat vet. Mm-hmm. I told Larry my problem. And Larry said, you'll do the homework. You'll show the respect. He says, I trust you to do a good job on it. So, so I took it. And uh, it was quite an experience because Wayne Van Zant, who I'm working with on the Medal of Honor comics, mm -hmm. he was my artist. And he introduced me to dozens of guys who had served in Vietnam uh, so I could check facts and get hear stories and mm -hmm. 
And that was an incredible experience talking to all these guys on the phone. So Chuck, another military title you did was called G.I. Joe, which is one of my favorites. Go Joe! How cool was it to write for Duke, Cobra Commander, Snake Eyes, and the rest? Well, on G.I. Joe, the proudest thing I was is that uh, when IDW decided to do it, that uh, Larry Hama was like, yeah, get Chuck to help. It's such a great ensemble cast. Yeah. Each character is so distinct. I always say that Larry created a comic book that, you know, was way better than any toy tie-in comic deserved to be. You know, he really put the work into it and made it something special on its own, not just a gimmick tied to a toy. And uh, so it was a lot of fun working, on, you know, with those characters in those situations. Who was your favorite character to write about and why? Scarlet ended up being my favorite character to write. Really? For a writer, you want tension and suspense. And women are naturally an underdog, especially in a military situation where they're fighting and things like that, which is not to say women aren't tough, but that always makes it a little easier to write. And I especially like when she would exceed the expectations of the enemy. You know, I I love a good, uh, you don't know who you're messing with story. And, uh, (laughs) And Scarlet is a perfect character for that. Yeah. Now you've written thousands of comics, things like Batman and Punisher and basically everything else. Is there one individual story that stands out as your personal favorite? My personal best comic of everything I've ever written is Nom number 66. And it's called The Creep. And it's about a uh, Marine sniper. His family farm is lost to back taxes. The tax man basically comes and takes the farm away. And uh, he excels at marksmanship, being a rural guy. And he becomes a top sniper in the Marines. And they assign him to kill Viet Cong tax collectors. Wow, that's a... (laughs) That's a motivating factor right there. Yeah. And, and, and I should say, when they take the farm, they take everything, including his Winchester rifle. Oh, man. And, yeah. and, and the day in the Marines when they make him a sniper and give him his Winchester back is this big moment. Yeah. So it's my, it's my favorite story of everything. And, and I wrote it all in one sitting. It came on. It was like God typing through my hands. I just came all out at once. So... I'm just listening to the storyline. I'm like, how do you come up with this kind of stuff? I think I had just done my tax return. That was the inspiration. <laughs> yeah, that would motivate you. Yeah, I know. I did, I did mine last year, and I wanted to tell the same story myself. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, it, it's uh, We could talk about this all day, but let's jump into uh, how a comic book is created. Dan, back to you. Yeah. You know, um, and we could talk about comic books all day. I'm excited. <laughs> but Chuck, tell us a little bit and our listeners, um, how do you actually build it? Where does it, where does it start? I mean, you sit down, get a bunch of people in the room and you just start writing or how do you put together a comic book? You know, generally, you know, you're put onto a character and you have to come up with the first story arcs. Uh, you, you talk over your initial stories with an editor. And then once you're, you know, in the groove and everybody agrees on what we're doing, then it's just off to the races. But it all begins with me. It begins with that blank screen and, uh, you know, yeah. page one, panel one, and just start writing. Yeah. From there, it goes to a, a penciler and he draws it in pencil. From him, uh, it goes to an inker who embellishes it with ink. It's then lettered by a letterer and colored by a colorist. And then, and then we're done. What's the interaction like between you and the artist once you've written the script? What I do looks very much like a screenplay. Uh, It has all of the dialogue, even the sound effects. Every artist works a little differently, but generally what the artist does is he'll look over, he'll read, hopefully read the whole script. I've had artists who will just go page at a time and that's, that never ends well. Uh, So he reads the whole script and then begins breaking down the pages into loose uh, layout form. And, and, and generally, he'll blow them up to do the finished pencils. Wayne Van Sant, the artist for the New Medal of Honor comic discussed today, was unable to join us for this interview. 
However, he was able to call in and give a shout out to our HUA hotline. Here's his message. My name is Wayne Van Sant. I uh, live in Mapleton, Georgia. Uh, I'm a writer and an illustrator. I myself was in the Navy, as my father was during World War II. But there's, I have a list of people here that uh, have all affected my life greatly. I'll just, just read their names off. Uh, Jim Huckabee. He was in the Signal Corps in the Southwest Pacific between 1942 and 1945. He passed away about three years ago, uh, right before he uh, was to turn 100. Another is Otis Bentley, 3rd Division, 15th Infantry, 1942-1945. Crawford Roddy, 85th Division, 1944-1945. Uh, James Pugh, 7th Division, 1945. Gene Tidwell, another uncle. 92nd Field Artillery Battalion, Korea, 1950-52. And one of my best friends, Joe O'Donnell, 173rd Airborne, Vietnam, 1968-1969. Thank you. If you'd like to give a shout out to someone in the Army family, leave us a voicemail at 703-236-2914 or email a voice note to podcast at ausa.org. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA, which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at shop.ausa.org. Welcome back to Army Matters. Chuck, your next project is on the AUSA Medal of Honor series. This version, which focused on Staff Sergeant Reuben Rivers, who's a Medal of Honor recipient. Can you tell us a little bit more about the man? Reuben Rivers was part of uh, the first uh, African-American armored unit. Yes. And, you know, highly decorated, a tough unit fighting in some of the most bitter fighting in Western Europe in World War II. I mean, they were the point of the spear. I remember a few years ago, uh, I was offered a chance to do a World War II themed project. And one of the ideas I pitched was called Patton's Panthers, about this very unit. As a kid growing up, the 761st Tank Battalion is what you're talking about. Yeah. It was, it was one that we studied. And I don't know if it was a comic book or it was just in the, from a history piece. Give us a little bit more about what Staff Sergeant Rivers did so he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Basically, he was the uh, commander of his outfit, mm -hmm. but he led from the front, even to the point of getting out of the tank sometimes to make things happen, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, uh, to me, that would be rule number one, don't get out of the tank. He cared so much about his men that he put himself in personal danger over and over and over again. And uh, to the point where he was told to withdraw, but basically said, look, as long as I can see the enemy, I'm going to keep on fighting. It eventually cost him his life uh, because he was going to, you know, cover the retreat of the rest of his unit. So, Chuck, the artist on this project is Wayne Vansant. I think you've worked with him before. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Wayne's awesome. Wayne's awesome. Okay. We worked on the Nam comic together. Right. He was an enormous help. And Wayne is a guy who will do the homework. Right. You'll find the right number of buttons on every tunic in a Wayne Vansant story. Right. He's got a vast, vast visual library of just about every period of uh, American military conflict. So um, when, when I'm writing for a guy like that, you know, I rest easy because I don't have to describe everything to him. I try to provide a lot of visual reference for my artists, but with okay. Wayne, you know, he's got it all. Now, what kind of research actually goes into a story like this? I mean, it must be more than just using the Medal of Honor citation, right? Joseph Craig, my editor, does most of the research. You know, Joe gives me the foundation. I mean, uh, and a lot of stuff to look at. Uh, you know, if there's videos, he sends videos. If there's audio, he sends audio. So there's a lot to go through. But even then, sometimes I'll look around a little bit on my own, largely to get dialogue, you know, because I mean, a lot of times we don't know what these guys said. You know, was there, was there anything they said that was interesting? And you kind of have to go outside. Because like the citation itself is, I mean, you guys know it's real dry. 
<laughs> it's not a lot of oomph there for a comic story. So sometimes I got to go looking. And then the process with the historians and the rest comes through with it. lots and lots of notes. I do more rewriting on this than I ever do on anything else I work on. Yeah, because you want to be you want to be really accurate. Like the Ruben Rivers story, you know, I wanted him up on that turret with the Madus, you know. And Joe's like, Yeah, but that's not really realistic. <laughs> is Joe over editing? Is he over, yeah, could we, no, 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 no. He can say he's, he's gotta be accurate though, because I know keep, no, he's, yeah, he's I know. keeping it honest. He's keeping me on. I mean, All I'm right, going right for a haunted tank, Sergeant Rock, you know, because yeah. I'm a comic book guy, you know. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, nah, yeah. it you know, yeah, it's not as dramatic, but it wouldn't look that way. Mm-hmm. And for our listeners too, we mentioned Joe's name a few times. Joe Craig, he is our director of our book program here at AUSA and does phenomenal work, not just with the graphic novel series, but with helping people get their work published and, and editing. And he's, uh, he is an incredible editor. But if you want to poke him a little bit, Chuck, if he's working you too hard or editing no, you too no, hard. No, no, no. He's a very patient man. Okay. I mean, he's working right. with comic book people. Yeah. <laughs> Send me a note. We'll, we'll take care of it. No, no, no. I'll, I'll hold up a help me sign. No, yeah, okay. uh, he's he. Uh, mm-hmm. No, he's very patient because it's like herding cats working with comic book people. I can only imagine. <laughs> Chuck, before we let you go, obviously you have passion for doing this. We've talked about several things that you've worked on, military related, throughout your career. But which army military story would you love to tell that hasn't been told? Yet? Oh boy. Um, I would love to do a graphic novel about uh, George Patton during the Mexican expedition. It's a story that doesn't get told very often. Wow. It works as a Western and a war story. Yeah. Because Patton was a very romantic figure about the American West. And he basically, you know, he was serving as a soldier, but he was also living out a lot of his Western fantasies in Mexico. And it's yeah. just a, it's jaw dropping. Like, no, that didn't really happen. That kind of stuff. And I, it's a story that needs to be told. Yeah. I mean, he was portrayed as a very charismatic guy in the movie, yeah. Patton, obviously. Yeah. So that would be a pretty interesting story. Maybe we'll have to get Joe Craig to, to commission some work with that, uh, yeah. with you, Chuck. And we can turn that into a graphic novel series as well. Yeah. So you grew up in Philadelphia. I got a couple of questions. I'm a Pennsylvania boy myself, born and raised, and it is the greatest state in uh, all of the union. <laughs> and uh, are you still living in the Pen- Pennsylvania area, Chuck? No, I'm in no. Florida now. <laughs> oh, you got to move down to the sunshine, huh? Yeah, sunshine. yeah. But you did grow up there, so I got to ask oh, a question. I grew up there. And this is a PA boy question. You'll get it right away. Okay. What's your favorite cheesesteak place in Philadelphia? Um, there used to be a place called Sea Cane Pizza, mm-hmm. and that was the best cheesesteak. Yeah. A lot of people go, do you like Pats or do you like Geno's? Yeah. I don't like either one. They're not real cheesesteaks. And you're, real you cheese know what? Sticks. You're a true Philadelphia boy. I could yeah. tell. I could tell yeah. because you're right. Because all the tourists would, would tell you Pat or Geno's. No. Hey, you know, and they're not bad places. I'm not knocking They're not them. bad. They're not, not, but they're not, those aren't cheesesteaks. They're not cheesesteaks. <laughs> no, they're not cheesesteaks. Yeah. Mom and pop shop is the best place. Find one. They're all different. They all got their little spin. Um, but it's all in the bread. That's the that's the secret sauce. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all in the bread. Yeah, it is. Well, Chuck, it's been incredible just to spend a little bit of time with you. And thank you for the work you do for us, highlighting the, the heroic acts and deeds of our nation's heroes of past. And we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. We just finished hearing Chuck Dixon talk about writing the stories of real-life Army heroes. Here at AUSA, we recognize them in many ways and today's chapter spotlight focuses on some of them. On December 6th of last year, the Texas Capitol Area Chapter held an award ceremony bestowing honors to some of its members, including Major General Retired Patrick Hamilton. Attended by retired military, active duty soldiers, and special guests, Chapter President Colonel Retired Gary D. Patterson also celebrated the 387th birthday of the National Guard with a formal cake cutting and remarks by Brigadier General Tanya Troust, Director of the Texas Military Department Joint Staff. Congrats to those heroes who received awards, to everyone who attended, and to the Texas Capital Area Chapter. If you or your chapter would like to be profiled on the show, please email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Hua. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Army Matters is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army Connected. 
Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission, educate, inform, and connect with the Total Army, our industry partners, and supporters of a strong national defense. Today's episode was hosted by Lieutenant General Retired Les Smith and SMA Retired Dan Daly, an anchor hosted by Carrie Viral Heckes. Anthony Dale Call is the producer and writer, and Andy Bosnack is the supervising sound editor. Ellen Toner is the content editor. Unzinga Curry is the executive producer, and the senior producers are Carrie Viral Heckes and LaSharon Duncan. Be sure to subscribe to Army Matters wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave a review. As you know, we love seeing stars in the Army, especially if it comes in the form of a five-star review. AUSA's Army Matters podcast can also be heard on Reese Across America Radio on Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, on the iHeartRadio app, the Odyssey app, and the TuneIn app with the search of the word Wreath. AUSA's Army Matters podcast primary purpose is to entertain. The podcast does not constitute advice or services. While guests are invited to listen, listeners, please note that you're not being provided professional advice from the podcast or the guest. The views and opinions of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of AUSA. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. I'm with Sharon Duncan. Hope you have a great Army day. Hua.